Ah, this is so great. I'm gonna see Don camera again. The Don and John show is going to resume. John Thornton, hey, you're welcome if you've been vaccinated. What are you, nuts? Of course I've been vaccinated. And what's more, that really did not hurt. But maybe the pandemic isolation has hurt a bit. This was my first visit to a non-relative's home in over a year, and I needed a big dose of positivity. Don's first attempt to cheer me up fell a little flat. But his second attempt did the trick. This is the spot where I sit twice a day. 11 o'clock, I'll come out before lunch. Three o'clock after my two hour nap, after lunch, I'll come and sit out here a little while longer and just marvel at the variety of plants around me. It's no different than it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, Don had a show of photographs of the gardens that he and his wife Marcy and their friend, the artist Tina Newberry, worked on in the yards behind their South Philadelphia row homes. I've been living here since 1985 with Marcy, and the gardening became a very important part of life on Federal Street. Originally, all the houses that surrounded me had old wooden fences, and they were the old Italian people that lived there. So I knock on their door and I say, hey, you know, I was in the backyard. I think you got termites in that fence of yours. You should let me get rid of it. Oh, would you really? Oh, you're such a saint. Oh my God, thank you, thank you, thank you. So all the wooden fences disappeared. And then there was just this big open space. Five houses worth of backyards. They let me weed first and then we started planting things and finding amazing what we call the Acme roses because they were all purchased at the Acme in 1957 and they're still alive under the weeds. So we unearthed the garden for a few years and then Tina came and started planting things and one thing led to another and then in 96 and 97 I photographed extensively with a really keen eye for everything. I spent six months in the dark room making prints and the show ultimately came in January of 2000 at the Art Institute. Don and Marcy loved their old Italian neighbors now sadly departed, Jean, Armand, Tony, Mary, the Tuzio family, Matt and Josephine, Carol, and Edith. This is the famous Edith, the woman who lived next door when I came here. She was in her 90s when she finally left and went up to her son's neighborhood. And she told me, and I believe, she was only north of Lombard Street twice in her life. Once to get married, and then in her early 90s when her son brought her up to the suburbs to put her in a home of some sort. So she was as provincial as South Philly gets, with a capital P-R-O. We went upstairs to look at the photos from Don's show, along with some related ones. This is a close-up of Edith's rose bush, the rose bush that was in the yard next to us when we first moved in. Edith had been there since the early 1900s, part of the original Italian families that moved in. Just another dramatic view of Edith's rose bush. Again, this was just in the middle of a little plot in the middle of a cement backyard, but this rose bush has probably been growing here for 70 years, and at one point in the season, it's flush with roses. Here's another shot of Edith's rose bush looking amazing. I tied this up to create this wonderful arch to create that sweep of roses with that piece of twine. Wonderful action, it's just incredible to me. I have made some movies about Don and Marcy's gardening partner, Tina Newberry. At the opening of Don's show, Tina came up to him and said, Oh my God, people aren't just drinking, they are actually looking at and talking about your work. Everybody wants to know what all these plants are. This to me was one of the more successful compositions, just because of, again, the whole microcosm of variety. 
I call it mixed greens. Mixed greens? Marcy, what are we really looking at? This is Coreopsis moonbeam. This is uh, nasturtium. This is rue. This is sage. Nasturtium again. And the cochiana. Here. How do you, how can you learn all these things? I, I just love it. <laughs> <laughs> this big fuzzy lamb's ear at the base, a hydrangea, which people call popcorn flower sometimes, and then these very delicate daylilies. Marcy knows the name. Hyperion. This is called Hyperion, yeah. We, we got rid of the page fence. Page fence? You know, the, 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 the cyclone fence. Oh. That's right, I call it Page Fence because in New Haven there was a company called Page that knew all the cyclone fencing around town. Cyclone so every fencing? How about chain chain link? Link? Oh my god. <laughs> this one are a couple of mystery plants we can't remember, but the color was just so sharp and rich against that dark brown tile that that's mainly the reason I took it. Wonderful ground cover called Ajuga right here. So the Ajuga comes from the side of a church that was on Locust Street. Tina was riding her bike by. In the springtime, it makes these fantastic fluorescent spike blue flowers. People were coming from all over the place just to see the Ajuga. This is the back of Maria Jard, Maria DLC, which has, I think I can see, four different kinds of roses. I jokingly call it white trash because of the broken yogurt container. I always thought it'd be a much more beautiful picture without that yogurt container, so a friend of mine digitally removed it for the invitation to the show. This is an early stage of the garden. Has a wonderful pipe sculpture made by Tom Beckett, my contractor back then. So this is one of the few pictures that still has the peach tree. The guy who lived there, Matt, his wife ate a peach and was like, Matt, this is the sweetest peach I ever ate. He planted it in the backyard and it made peaches for the next 25 years by the bushel load. And they were good, really good peaches. Variety is the spice. I mean, everything is here. Your hydrangea, here's those wonderful peaches that I talked about. Oh, what are those pink flowers? Marcy knows. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a Rosa Sharon. See these big giant leaves? I'm not sure what they are, but this was a beautiful thing. It made these spikes that would start with the purple flowers and work their way down. I can't remember the name of this plant because I kept calling it Big Bird. It just reminded me of Big Bird from Sesame Street. Uh, Marcy, when she's not here, she would tell you it might be Mullion. I can't remember. But again, I just like the big bird meets this delicate little wisteria vine that's growing up. Uh, no, it's a clematis, a clematis vine. This is one of the rooftop shots. Occasionally I walk out on the roof when I like the overall look. Again, a nice shot of the peach tree when it was still alive. We call this one Westward Yo, because it faces Broad Street, going west. Just a little section of the garden. This is a plant called Rue, we saw it earlier. It's a wonderful plant. One of my tenant's fathers, who was from Puerto Rico, said when he was a kid, they would put it in rubbing alcohol because it had a medicinal quality and it would make your arthritis better. So it has some sort of medicinal quality to it. There's a yarrow, Coreopsis moonbeam. It's looking a little shabby. I always felt like this was the closest thing I ever took to like a gothic garden picture because it's so dark and everything looks like it's half dead, but it's alive and has a crypt-like feel. To me, it has a very cosmological feel. It's almost like stars at night. Oh, okay. The little, uh -huh. little bright lights. Right, the darkness represents the void and yeah. the shapes pop out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, to each his own. Hey. It's one of the most beautiful ones in terms of the, the flowers showing off their true colors in just the perfect quality of light. Just the way they ref the colors reflect out, the brightness of the reds. Even though they're darker reds, they're brighter than that particular pink. And then this really fluorescent peony coming out of nowhere. This is actually three roses. There's another rose up here. So this is called Three Roses and a Peony. This one is one of Marcy's favorites just because of its urban survival green nature. Trapped in one eighth of an inch of soil between these two slabs of cement, that puff of green can emerge. And you notice how vertical it looks, how it's like, 
It's winning the battle, man. Victory over cement. Because in reality, I know it's a little secret, this is how it actually was taken. Uh, why this is a wall it? because I wanted it going up to make up all the victory stuff, you know. Oh, uh, okay. Because <laughs> that looks ordinary to me. That looks more ordinary. But when you do it like this, it's like putting some, putting some grease in your hair and pushing it up with a little bit of style, you know. Something that I personally cannot do. Are you that little puff of green yourself? If you wanted to boil it down to one plant, I guess you could say that, yeah. <laughs> I just love the spirited action of the lavender blooms. The purple against that battered gray background as if that is some ancient sky way off in the distance and these are the fireworks. And here's the hydrangea in the background. But I loved it for like its firework quality. Turn it off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got that? <laughs> this one has my favorite title. This is called Vera Jameson in Love, because of naturally the heart shape. It's a sedum, Marcy loves sedums. And then there was another one, this was called Artemisia, way in the background. It was this really powder green, very soft. The birds loved it in the springtime and they would pick it clean because it made their nests like sealy postropedics. My favorite part of this was how the heart just led you to this brightly lit area back here that really feels like a long distant landscape of a forest from an aerial point of view looking on the top of the trees. Of course, I left a lot of dead leaves and plastic rims, but I thought amongst that Home Depot reality, there was this incredible love affair and this wonderful landscape we both living there. When it came to the way the different colored flowers would reflect back the light, this one was the most successful. Ren Victoria was the name of this particular rose. Just the way it filled up with light and came back in. Every one was unique. These guys were a regular. Throughout the whole 1990s, we had these spiders. In the last 10 or 15 years, I haven't seen them around. The big yellow things, and they would make these insanely zigs, like they were drunk spider webs. I always thought it would be just catch the attention of the flying bugs. Man, they ate well back there. Sort of the dog camera of the <laughs> Kind world. of, yeah. They're better dressers than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I can attest to that. Notice how Don's dressy look for our day of filming was the same red t-shirt he wore six years ago to Tina's opening. I like to fade into the background, as they say. <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> <laughs> and no respectable garden can be a garden without sunflowers, certainly. So this was our contingent of sunflowers in the years of 95 and 96. Don's exhibition attracted the attention of Philadelphia's Art at City Hall program. A curator was planning a show on the theme of community gardens and assigned Don to document a garden at 25th and Tasker. The people that ran this garden were transplants from the South after World War II. They came up from the South to work in the whatever remaining factories in South Philadelphia. They grew peanuts, all kinds of food stuff. It had been a factory and Mrs. Jackson, who was a real whirlwind of a social organizer, got the factory knocked down and the city to clear the land for them to have their garden. This was a huge garden. It's still going right now. Mrs. Jackson, I'm sure, is long gone, but that garden is still cooking because people are still taking care of it. Mrs. Jackson's garden was a wonderful place. This picture was taken the day before the Philadelphia City Gardens contest. So everything was trimmed nice and really ready for the judges to come take a look. I went down, got a nice clear day. The collard green reigns supreme. The marigolds were there to keep the bugs away. And I love this little area here of the trim leaves. They're so silvery and edible. I picture a little Peter Rabbit coming up and taking one back to the nest. Here's another photograph taken down at 25th and Tasker, Mrs. Jackson's garden. All her cabbages and scallions, of course. Right by this wonderful WPA bridge from the 1930s that was bringing transport trains and still does. It's still a functioning bridge. 
And the, the idea of just all these things melding, the WPA bridge right in front of the garden with the ladies that came up from the south that are still growing peanuts. And to me, it was just an amazing circle that was appearing in front of me. And that's why it was a great opportunity to photograph there. For someone who obviously loves nature the way you do, why did you choose to live in a city? Is your garden a way to cope with the concrete jungle? I like the city as much as I like the garden. I would not be happy if I had to get in a car and wait 15 minutes before I saw civilization. You know, I need to be in an urban area. But obviously these pictures are proof that you could have both. I was feeling a heck of a lot better. And then I asked Don to tell me about his own pandemic experience. Being stuck in the house for the last 15 months, I definitely pondered more than usual. You know, who am I? Where did I come from? Why do I like what I like? Both my parents have passed away. And one of the things I took from the house that I grew up in was this print of this painting. My mother bought it in the early 1960s. She put it up over the couch. This was as close to art as I got, other than what the world book said about art. I didn't know this at the time, but the more I look at it, I realize it was her impression of what the world would be like if it was a perfect place. She was a 19th century person. Born in 1919, her parents didn't speak English. She was on this little farm. She had a lot of responsibility as a little girl because of circumstances. She believed in doing things the old school way because that's what she knew worked. So this to her was the way to go. And it just didn't occur to me, but I loved looking at this picture from age five or six on. It was in the room with all my toys, with the TV, with everything. So I've been looking at it and I realized it's this village life where everybody knows everybody, where everybody makes the same amount of money, you know, this idyllic small time world that she thought was the happiest way to go. Our street was like that. It was a dead end street. And in her day, it was really like that. I always got lectures about you don't want to make that much money because money brings problems and people with money got nothing but big problems. You just want to, my father always said, you don't need to make more than $8,000 a year. That's what a good factory worker makes in 1967 and that was the advice that I got. So this to me, once I got in here and I kept looking at it, I realized, yeah, that is kind of the life she was silently suggesting to me with this picture and all the photographs I buy are of 19th century farm scenes, my affinity for dirt and gardening and plants, the idea that living things out the way it used to be ain't all that bad. <laughs> I can't believe I'm getting emotional. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. I just... I'll be honest. When I arrived at Don and Marcy's, I had been depressed, but by the time I left, their hospitality and wisdom had turned my mood around. And I went home with a present. Don has very generously given me this portrait of Saul Steinberg by, who took the book? Inga Moraith, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. M-O-R-A-T-H. She made many pictures of him uh, in these masks, in various situations, and uh, she was a part of the scene. Thanks, Don, for making me feel like I'm always part of this scene, too.